Afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Forrester. I'm a TV journalist, and I'm here to help guide you and hold your hand through a series of NDS uh, expert panels, their perspectives series. And this afternoon, there are probably, or there is probably, no other more important session than this advanced advertising. Where are we going? What's the industry doing? How are Advertise, advertisers, pay TV broadcasters, and broadcasters in general, tapping into the audience that they have. We have a great panel of experts on our extreme, on your extreme left-hand side, Giddy Gilboa, Senior Product Ma Marketing Manager for Advertising Solutions at NDS. Welcome, Giddy. Uh, Keith, now I'm gonna mangle this, Keith, forgive me. Christian, sort of, yeah, Christian. Uh, Senior Vice President Sales at Black Arrow. Lauren Gore, TV Executive at Zenith, Optimedia, and finally here, but not least, Nick Burfitt, Global Rapid View Director, Kantar Media, and I'm going to ask each of you three here to just briefly tell us who you are and what your company does for those who perhaps are not so familiar with the advertising community. Yeah, um, Black Arrow is an advanced advertising uh, platform provider, and we sell to both the service providers as well as the content providers, and it's really about enabling addressable advertising um, across existing cable platforms as well as new emerging IP platforms. Uh, uh, Lauren? Uh, I work for Zenith Optimedia. We are a advertising, planning, and buying company. I have specialized in entertainment advertising for the past five years. And Nick, uh, Kantar Media? So Kantar Media are an audience measurement company. We run services in 59 countries around the world. and. More recently, in the last few years, we've developed a, a set of set-top box-based measurement services for various pay TV operators around the world. Fantastic. That places every, everyone in context. Guys, I don't want any advertising on my TV set. <laughs> Do viewers want addressable advertising, advertising that's more targeted to them? Please, uh, uh, Keith. Well, you know, I, I think there's going to be have to be advertising that follows premium content. I think it's just part of the business model. I think the pay, pay TV um, component as well as the advertising component are just what drives the premium content production in that industry. And um, I think, you know, how I see it playing out is data will be used more over time for traditional linear as well as on-demand TV delivery. And if you can bring more relevant ads, and maybe even less ads potentially over time if they're more targeted, I think the viewer's gonna be fine with that. Yeah, I, I no, I'd, I'd buy into that. I'd buy into more material that really address what I perhaps wanted or coveted. Uh, Lauren, is this how you see it? Uh, I do see it like that as well. Um, but I think it depends if the message is a rational message or an emotional message. So if it's for an FMCG company uh, telling you of a new product they've got that you'd be interested in. I think consumers would be happy with that. But if you're trying to put onto them uh, a service uh, which is more of an emotional service that they need to decide for themselves, they might find it intrusive. Yeah, well, w do, I, do I, from an FMCG, from a big soap uh, powder manufacturer, I don't want baby advertising. You know, it's wasted on me and it annoys me. How targeted do you think we can go? You can go quite targeted in the sense of you know information on the households, but then you don't know information about the individuals within those households. So if you're a household with two parents, a teenager, and a young child, your household could be delivered an ad for uh, baby milk, but that could be delivered to the teenage son where it's still gonna be irrelevant. So you, n you can drill down furthermore than we do currently but there's still going to be a degree of wastage whereby you don't know which individual in the household is actually watching at one time. Uh, for sure. Uh, Nick, how are you analyzing and number crunching and being prepared for this wonderful new opportunity? Um, yeah, so we've been involved in a couple of addressable advertising trials in the US um, with Comcast. And, and one of the key findings out of that was, I think there was a general acceptance or a view coming out that viewers were more receptive to ads that were targeted to them. They tended to stay with the advertising longer. Now, $64,000 question, are the advertisers ready? Is the advertising or the creative community ready to exploit this uh, great opportunity? Keith? 
Yeah, I think um, where w you know we spend a lot of time in the U.S. market, and I can say that in terms of working with the content providers, you know, the advertisers are buying addressable inventory today on digital, and they have for a long time. And I think th that trend will continue into the TV space, and they're comfortable buying audiences. I think um, they're comfortable buying audiences again premium content, and we see a tremendous kind of pent up demand with the advertisers for this really? type of yeah targeted inventory. Uh, Lauren, what are your clients uh, th doing or thinking about? Um, I work on music clients looking after their advertising, so they've got a huge amount of information uh, about the consumers. And whereas at the moment we're targeting, for instance, 1634 men in London with addressable advertising, we can ensure that there may be 16 to 24 single men in a particular region within London. So my clients already hold the information about their consumers, and so this is something they could pick up relatively quickly. Uh, but but who's funding this extra effort? Because it, it isn't cheap, and there is wastage. We, we, everyone recognizes that. Uh, uh, how do you square that circle with your clients? Well, at the moment, there's a degree of wastage in all the advertising we buy. Um, and so, obviously, we'd be paying a premium for addressable advertising. Um, and so it's just whether the audience segment that we're after uh, is large enough to pay off the premium that we'll be paying for the addressable advertising. And in your experience, this is beginning to, to feed through positively? Yeah, definitely. Right. Um, uh, Nick, what advice are you giving your clients as to how they, uh, they approach this, uh, this challenge? Yeah, I mean, I think um, on the question of advertisers and, and our media agency clients, I think some are more ready than others. Um, there's a, you know, different levels of engagement or enthusiasm in that process. Does it come down but to sector? I mean, does it come yeah, down to... Yeah, a lot to of it does it is driven by what sector they're operating in, absolutely. Um, but we've just partnered with DirecTV in the US, All right. and they've literally, in the last week, just launched their DirecTV addressable advertising platform, and it will go national uh, in 2012. And we've seen a massive amount of interest from advertiser clients in that platform, so I think they're ready for it. Now, Giddy, you're not here just to be a bookend. <laughs> it's your technology that, by and large, uh, has to cope and direct and feed this material um, into the home uh, without alienating uh, the, the consumer too much, at least. Um, how are you solving it? Well, I think um, you know the DirecTV uh, deployment that Nick was mentioning is something we're involved in, and I think. From our perspective, the technology is something we are making a lot of effort on so that it's really not the problem, okay? I think uh, we, we largely solve the issue of how we can do addressable advertising even on one-way networks uh, by using devices like the DVR that has local storage for advertising in it. So and they would insert, that, that the ad is just inserted. Yes, yep. so, yes. So, so this is the sort of th stuff that leading operators like DirecTV will be launching. So uh, we made a lot of effort to, to make sure that it works wonderfully and it's all smooth. And now the issues and the um, challenges are more on the business side and you know, how you sell, how you buy, how you measure. Um, so I think you know, our job is just to make it smooth and work well. Now, in the same way that we've spoken, or the industry has spoken about addressable or targeted advertising for quite some years, and only now are we beginning to see some traction. For many years, we've learned or heard about the internet of things, where our fridge is going to be wired up to the set-top box and would automatically order up the next pint of milk. Um, but is this sort of data or this sort of future going to make it easier for targeted advertising or not? Uh, how do you see it? As a company, I, I, I think technologically, for sure, when you, when you, have, TV, when you have connected devices in the home, when now you have multiple screens, friends, it changes Twitter, things Facebook, a bit because you're class, able in real time to understand what people are viewing, what now, people are consuming, on what device. Those devices are personalized in many ways as opposed to the set of box where we talked about the issue of knowing who the individual is. So I think our technology is going from the set of box forward would look at how you do actually cross device multi device uh, advertising so imagine you have a campaign that actually follows you depending on what device you are uh, consuming on it might have different executions depending on the device so if it's a personal tablet you would have uh, you know more interactive experience and if it's a tv it'll be more a passive emotional message type of experience so we're able to do you know all of these options now um, standards, um, uh, technology standards, 
are one thing, and we can address that while you've got the microphone. Uh, uh, does this sector need that sort of um, uh, easy to uh, uh, interact, uh, not so much interact, easy to, sw to, to swap and exchange um, uh, uh, the, the actual commercial message? So are standards needed in that area? Yeah, I mean, for sure, in any industry, you need standards. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the US, there's quite a lot of activity that we're involved in, uh, so are Black Arrow and others, in defining standards for basically um, uh, managing the whole workflow of advanced advertising on TV. So things like, uh, sorry for the language, but SCT 130 and SCT 35, and all these boring standards that are all about making sure that different systems could talk to each other. The reason why it's important is because you might have, I mean, if you look at who uh, is selling most of the advertising today, it's not the TV operators, it's the broadcasters, Absolutely. the networks. And you have multiple entities that need to take part in this game. So you have the broadcaster, you have the TV operator, you have the agencies, of course, you have the measurement, you have... So all of these people need to talk together and stand uh, 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 How big or how small, Keith, I'll come to you. How big or how small do you need that audience to be? DirecTV, great example, uh, 20 million homes, uh, probably 40 to 50 million people in the, uh, in the collective uh, region. But there are plenty of other pay TV operators and uh, if you like closed, uh, closed units with only an audience of uh, a few hundred thousand. Um, is that manageable or do you really need scale? I think I would leave that question to, to <laughs> either of those two, but I think, you know, we, we were looking in the U.S. market, I think until we got to about 10 million homes, yep. um, it was really just trials and, and proof of concepts. And I just want to touch on one point that Giddy said, which is really important, is the technology is there, it's the business model for making this happen, and the, the hardest part to figure out is that, you know, the broadcasters sell most of the inventory, but the service provider has the subscriber relationship and they own the data. And what, what isn't clear today, or at least needs to evolve, is how the service providers are creating new business models that are leveraging their data uh, that's offered back to the content providers so that they can do more effective advertising for their clients. Sure. And what do those economic models look like in terms of these new services that a service provider is offering back to a content provider? That's what's being figured out, and it's, it's a hard problem because there's a lot of kind of existing relationships in place, but that'll evolve over the next year or so, and I think that'll really open up the deployment of this stuff in, at broader scale. But, but uh, every, every um, system, you know, a Comcast or a Time Warner, um, they've got, uh, you know, urban upscale people. I'm thinking of, I'm looking at Manhattan now, you know, pair of operators, uh, but some very, very different demographic challenges, just the length of that eight miles, as you'd have with any city. Uh, how do you see that uh, being resolved? I, I think it, it's really up to what the, the advertisers and the buyers want. It's pretty easy. I mean, if you have household level data, it's pretty easy to group those together. I mean, you can have an advertiser bring their own list of loyal customers they have in their program and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a service provider could match that list and just deliver ads to those folks. But it's very easy to group different um, audiences together once you have that granular information and either make it a larger set of audiences or a smaller one. Sure. Uh, Lauren, how are you addressing that problem? How are you solving that, uh, that dilemma? Well, I think, um, especially for uh, my clients, um, it doesn't matter how broad uh, the, the universe is because our t uh, we would come up with a target audience for every individual product and brand, and therefore we can decide, you know, it doesn't matter the, the, how broad the demographic is our talk target audience will be somewhere within there and through the information we can get from uh, the addressable advertising we know we're targeting the correct people so it doesn't matter if it's a very broad spectrum. Now I've mentioned standards, the, the technical standards but there's also the ethical standards. Um, uh, tell us Nick what, uh, how the consumer well, has the consumer in any way reacted to information about their buying habits and viewing habits being put together, getting out into uh, the hands of these uh, very, very savvy people? <laughs> um, I don't think we've seen very strong negativity in that area, to be honest. I think it comes down to an issue of transparency and openness from the operator and the providers of this. Um, and I know Sky in the UK who are moving towards targeted advertising on their TV platform uh, have already started their campaign to educate their subscribers about what's coming and what it will mean for them and the benefits it will, 
that they will get from that. So I think it comes down to partly an education process and also being transparent with the subscribers. Um, uh, Giddy, uh, uh, what's in it for the operator? Uh, if it's just passing through, if it's a commercial broadcaster exploiting this information, there's no gain for the, uh, for the, for the, for the operator themselves, or is there a gain? Yeah, so um, just before this panel, I did a very quick calculation looking at the, I guess, top 15 NDS customers. Uh, on a year, on an average year, they uh, pass through about $17, $17 billion worth of advertising. And as you say, rightfully so, most of this revenue doesn't fall to their p in their pockets. It goes to the networks. So I think the premise of, of advanced advertising is these operators improving the quality of advertising, making it more measurable, addressable, interactive across platforms because these are the gatekeepers. And then enhancing the value of that $17 billion and taking a cut from that. So, so this is really the, the game here, and this is what we're trying to, uh, to achieve and help our customers achieve over time. Uh, well, that's the goal. Let's uh, finally ask uh, each of you three experts uh, five years from now. Um, big, medium, small advantage. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel, Keith? Oh, I, th I think, it, I mean, today, uh, you look at the U.S. Ad, uh, television advertising market, it's really strong right now. And there's basically no addressability in, in, that, in that linear or those on-demand um, delivery. And I think you start bringing addressability um, at high quality with transparency that consumers are okay with into the television market, I think that market's going to continue to, to grow and be very, very strong. And the other thing I would say that I think needs to happen is I think the value of where uh, an ad is seen, the viewing environment context is going to become really important. Absolutely. So what's the value of me seeing an ad in my home on my living room in a big screen when I'm watching a show versus an hour for an hour versus watching a short form piece of content you know, in a mobile context? And I think advertisers are going to stay, take more of that into, in, into concern when they start placing their buys. But I think, yeah, there's huge opportunities for the addressable TV market. Lauren, your view? Uh, I think it's definitely going to uh, be much bigger in the next five years. Um, at the moment, niche uh, products, they can't really afford to advertise on broad TV channels, whereas this will give them the opportunity to go on TV where they've never had that opportunity before, and therefore I think the market's going to definitely grow. Sensible point, good point. Uh, what do you, what's yeah, I'd agree. I think it's going to be a very significant part of the TV uh, airtime environment in five years' time. It won't replace the linear spot advertising market in that time frame, but it'll definitely be a, a big, big element of it. Uh, it's something to watch out for. Uh, lady and gentlemen, thank you very much. Giddy, thank you. Uh, Keith, Lauren and Nick, thank you very much.